The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. I think in the end of July in Washington, it's a very good camp. I think it's a second year. And Jeff, in his keynote, did um, an Uber cart e-commerce site in 30 minutes. And I thought that was really practical, um, an example for, to show people that might come to a camp and don't get to experience what actually site building looks like. You might learn about a module, you might see conceptual slides and things, but not actually get to see it done. So I borrowed that from Jeff and asked him, and he said, go for it. Um, he also um, did his in D6, and we'll be doing D7 today. So the other prerequisites are to have a test environment, a way that you can install local um, Drupal and set up an, what's known as an AMP environment, I guess. DAMP might stand for Drupal, MAMP for Mac, WAMP for Windows, or XAMP for some kind of cross-platform. You need to kind of know that, and there's plenty of help online to get you up and running. We won't be doing that part. We'll assume you have already done that. And lastly, the ability to read. I'm sure most people can or are working on it, hopefully. <laughs> um, specifically, the readme.txt file that comes with Drupal when you install it. You'll need to take the time, which we won't have time today, to cover those things because they're written very specifically for people that don't know how to do something. It's the instruction manual. Unless you'd like to build things without reading and understanding, I, t I highly recommend it. I still use them. When I download a module, I open the readme and see what the developers have to say. And usually it's up to date. If it's not the module page where you've downloaded a contrib module or Drupal core or um, a theme, it's going to have everything you really need to know in the instruction manual. So it's kind of advice you might not normally follow if you're building IKEA parts at home, but it's really helpful in the world of site building. Um, I advertised all of these things that we would be able to pull off, and, and I did this as a survey of what, what most beginners would like to learn. Um, and I talked to some guys in Florida that suggested these things, so I tried my best to pull them off. The reality is this is all we're gonna have time to get to today. So if that's a bummer and you wanna leave, I'm sorry, go ahead, feel, I'm not ashamed if you have to leave now. So that's basically it, it's time to get started. I'm gonna talk fast, I'm normally a slow talker because I'm from the South. And also, hopefully, which is not a bummer, we're gonna do this in a pre-recorded format um, which has already started, and I'll try to do kind of like VCR controls. So I've recorded this, so we can do it. We can play back and speed up. Okay, I think we're back. Thank you. That was fast work. Um, so to start off to build a Drupal site, you're going to go. We're going to visit Drupal.org a couple times a day. We're going to go to the Download and Extend button, and if you can see. There's a couple places you can get to from this. There's modules and themes and core. The big green button is what we're going to start with today. So I'm going to go down here and I'm going to read through this along with you know the README file once I've done the download. I'm going to get the recommended release of Drupal, which is the green bar. Um, pull that down to my local folder that I've already sent, set up in my MAMP environment so that I have a web page that will pull up where this folder is sitting. I've done that part in advance of this. And when, you've, when you pull down Drupal, this is what it looks like when you've unzipped it on your local computer. And you see here there's the readme.txt file. So this is Drupal. This is what it looks like out of the box. How many, just to pause for a second, how many have never done that much? A couple? That's good. So it's, well, this would be good. How many have you done it like over 100 times? All right. All right, so, so it might be boring for some of you. Um, pulling it down to your, to your local computer and then pulling up the web server that you've set up through MAMP, loading that up for the very first time will take you to the installer by default. So you have install.php ready to go for you. And then you're gonna walk through the setup st steps for Drupal and put the standard install so we get the most of the modules that 
come with core that we want, and we can just use English for today's example. You could add as many languages as you need for your site. The second step to actually setting up Drupal is to set up a database so that the content, the CMS part of it, can store this data in a database. We're gonna do that part using our WAMP environment, which has a PHP MyAdmin web interface so that you can add databases. It's not that complicated, and in this case, all we're gonna do with PHP MyAdmin is create a database because we got stuck on that installer that says we have to. So as soon as that's done, we're not gonna come back to PHP, I, PHP MyAdmin because we don't really need to, thankfully. Um, but it's there as a tool in your AMP environment. So once that's done, we're back, to, we're gonna close that tab and we're gonna come back to our installer and we're gonna use the, the name of the database that we put in, dcc.localhost for Drupal Camp Charlotte. Um, the username and password is something that would be provided by your AMP environment and we're gonna give it those credentials. Then the next step, in the kind of wizard setup of Drupal core is installing the modules that come with it. And it, what, the, what it's doing here is installing all the modules that are in that standard profile in that option when we did standard. If we, if we had picked minimal, it would install a lot less. But for our purposes and general purposes, standard is what you're probably gonna go for. Next up is the actual setting up of the kind of configuration in Drupal. The site information is the basic name of your site. It's what you're gonna see in the header if you decide to use that later. The site email address is the outgoing emails, what address they come from. You know, like forgotten passwords have to come from an address, that's that address. Um, the site maintenance account, which is the next section, I'm gonna kind of get ahead of the, the playback here. The site maintenance account is the user that we're gonna do all the installations under, under that account. He's the kind of super user, or she, or it, is doing everything, it can do everything in Drupal. Drupal has a pretty complicated permissions and roles system, but we're gonna only look at the simplest part of it today, where there's, we're gonna use the site maintenance account, give it a, a name and a username and password, set up a default country and, and um, time zone, and later we'll look at the anonymous account, which is the person that doesn't even know that you can log in or just goes to your site without logging in. So there, it can get more complicated, but we're going to keep it really simple for this, for this demo today. So in about um, less than 10 minutes, we should have Drupal installed. And that's the welcome page. So that's not that complicated. It could probably be more streamlined if you do it the second time, but and, and in a sandbox on your local environment, it's all just practice, so get comfortable with it. If you need to re, re, go through the process again, just to create a new database, create a new site, or just scratch those things out and, and start over, and it's really not that kind of complicated. It shouldn't scare you if you've never done it. So by default, when you land on your welcome page after installing Drupal, you're oriented here with a toolbar at the top, a kind of site maintenance account, the guy that's the super user that can do everything gets this at the top and, and a couple hints to where you can add content because that's the first thing we're gonna do. The goal for us today is to get a site that's up that looks kind of like a traditional website where you have an about us page, a contact us page. We're gonna have a, some views and we're gonna add media to our site. So the first thing we're gonna do is pretend like we have a client, we got one hour to get this site built, let's go ahead and start building it. So we're gonna use these add content links and add two, um, one type of content. You get two with Drupal out of the box. You get an article, which is kind of like a, blo a blog post, kind of time sensitive content, and basic pages. Basic pages are perfect for about us, and that's what we're gonna make here. With, with the content type, of article or page, it comes with these fields, title and the body where you tell the world about us, and that's what we're just kind of reviewing here. Um, it also comes with these options, and these are options that are related to your content type. We're gonna go with a lot of the defaults, and that's what I suggest for beginners, because there's a ton of options here, and rather than start tinkering with all of them, go with one, the ones that are set by default for you learn how that works, interact with it, and then come back and, and adjust them as you need to. So a title, every, every node, as they're called in Drupal, has a title, and that's so we can find the content and look at it later. We're gonna call it About Us. 
and we're going to use just some placeholder text, which is known as lorem ipsum. It's just kind of gibberish, just so it looks like we actually have an about us page. Okay, so everything cool with audio? It had tahini in it. I don't know if you, yeah, and I mean, it was, dude, it was. You got um, interference. Someone else. You know what I mean? So, um, oh man, it was. Awesome. Should we all go to that session? <laughs> okay, well, I'll, if if you guys can hear me, I can tune it out if you can. You know what I mean? Like, you can. So we've made an about us page where, where additionally we're using a non default option of adding a menu link. A menu link is just going to give add an option. Thank you, Hannah. Um, an option so people can get to your page. By default, you get a, a type of menu called main menu that comes with Drupal. That's your main menu that folks will be able, you can add content to so folks can get to the link that you created. If we didn't do that, it'd be, it would land you back on the about us page that you just corrected, but you wouldn't have this, this option, this is what the uh, main menu is. So by default, Drupal is gonna give you the, the node that you just create in the view version of it, and then later, if you'd like, you can edit in case you made an error or something. This is called, I think, inline editing. So we'll see here, we can edit that link and go back and make a change if we had to, which is a kind of, it's different than other CMSs when you're actually viewing the content and you decide you want to edit it with the right privileges as the site maintenance account, you can do it right there on screen to make it a little faster for you and easier, hopefully. So, um, We're going to hop over here in Chrome um, as what I, what's known as incognito window. How many of you use Chrome? Show of hands. It's a, it's a nice browser. It has this nice feature. Firefox has one. I don't know about Explorer. Um, the incognito window is a good... Well, but, but I think the key is that the this is what incognito, the, 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 incognito the window looks like in uh, and, Chrome. You, know, just you get this title bar that's that. blue, and I mean, you get the little private eye guy on the far right side. This is really good for you want to stop where you are with your site and see what it looks like for people that have never been to your site or if you're going in as the anonymous user. And that's an actual type of user in Drupal. It's got a user ID of zero, and this is what they see. They, they can log in. They can see your About Us page. And that's really all they can do, but in about 15 minutes, you got a home page and you got an about us page, and it doesn't look terrible. It, it's using this default blue, it's called Bartik theme, and we're gonna, we're gonna work on changing that as well. But it's kind of good to go back and forth between your maintenance account, the one you're doing all your content authoring in, and your anonymous view, and keep that person in mind, because those, the perception and the things you see on the page are very different for them a lot of times, especially as you add more modules. If we look up in the address bar, um, or excuse me, the main menu bar, you see that about us was before home. Um, that's, a, that's something you can change by going to the structure of your site, which is up in the toolbar. And then looking at the menus option, there's four menus that come with Drupal. The main menu is the one we added our content to. It's really simple to reorder and drag around the order of those things, and I'm showing you here an example of putting home above about us. So that shows up before, I think most websites would do it that way, where you go home, left to right, and about us. And as we add more content, we'll come back and use that menu links administration page to kind of structure it in the way we want it to see visually for the user in the menu system. So now we have home and about us as we yeah. We're going yeah, for that kind of traditional yeah, know, client website. It's sort of a brochure like site. It. Users aren't going to really log into our site. Yeah. We're just building a site in one hour to get it out there for a client because we want to make a quick 500 bucks and skip lunch or something like that. I don't know. So one thing we can do, if I hop back into the edit of About Us and we go to the URL path settings, what I'm changing here is the address bar. Right now, I can put in some free text in the URL alias option, and if you look in the address bar, we just switched from what was node slash one, which is how Drupal stores all of the paths inside of it. That's how Drupal can find the content that you add. You can change that so it's more SEO friendly, and up in the address bar it says about dash us. You can do that manually, which is what we've just done. Or you can also make it, this is what I consider URL aliases the hard way. 
We're going to come back to that in a moment and change it the easy way by adding a contrib module that'll do that for us. Before we do that, I want to show you what adding a different kind of content type in Drupal, known as a blog or an article. This is time sensitive content. And what, what's going on here is that you're adding the same thing you did just for About Us. You're going to give it a, to a title. And then additionally, you have a tags. We're not going to use tags in our demo today. But a content type that adds tags is just it's just a different, it's the same process, um, but you've got tags and you've got an image in this case, so there's different fields for different types of content. And that's, that's the most flexible option with um, Drupal is to be able to extend it and add content types like a, a new one of your own and give it fields. We're gonna see that in a second. But right here, we're, we're gonna um, skip the URL path aliases. So if we go back and we save our new article, and we look in the address bar, it says node slash two. So Drupal's building up this, this system of knowing what content is referred to as nodes and node IDs, which is the two part of that address. So I'm gonna hop into fast forward mo motion here and add two more blog entries and show you how we can stop putting in manually URL aliases so we don't have to send our friends our, our new link to our blog post and say, here it is, check it out, it's dcc.localhost slash node slash three or whatever like that. So we're adding three blog entries just to get some real quick content into our system. And then we're gonna add a contrib module that'll kind of fix those paths for us so that everything comes out SEO friendly and looks better in the address bar. That, ma that module is um, called Path Auto. We're, up, we're gonna do that next, but before we do, let's look back at our uh, homepage as our incognito view in Google Chrome. And you see all of this content is showing up now on the homepage of your Drupal site. That's a, that's a feature that comes with Drupal. By default, all the content you add to your site shows up on the homepage, and that's called the content stream or the river of news or something like that. It's an option we're gonna change, but before we do that, let's fix that path auto issue. So I think I'm still in fast forward. Let me slow down just a little bit. We're going back to drupal.org and download extend. This time we, we switch to the modules tab. Oh, I think we're still in fast forward. And I'm downloading path auto really quickly. We've unzipped them on our local folder. We've read the readme files, right? Didn't we all read those? And back to um, our maintenance account, we're gonna go to modules. We're gonna see all the list of modules that we currently have unzipped in our sites all module folder. We have this new one called Chaos Tools Suite. Let's imagine that wasn't there and that we forgot it. If we went down here to the views section, and we enabled the two required modules, views UI, so we have an interface to build the view, and views, which is the main module you need. You see there's a dependency called Chaos Tools. At that point, you could go enable it, or say you forgot. You could just go ahead and hit Save Configuration, and it's gonna say, wait a minute, there's a dependency here, because again, contrib modules are borrowing from other contrib modules to kind of reuse functionality, and this is an example where views has to use Chaos Tools to do so. so We've done that, or we've gone back to Drupal because we forgot chaos, tool, chaos Tools. We've unpacked it, we've got it on our machine, and we're installing it. That's all there is to installing modules. You see how site building becomes that kind of ritual of going to drupal.org and finding the stuff you need, and then trying it out in your sandbox after you've, after you've enabled it. Views comes under structure. So it, after you've read the readme, you kind of, most readmes tell you where to go to use and then set up the module. And in this case, Views is adding structure to our site. It's putting content into list. By default, there's a couple views that come with Drupal. We're gonna leave those as is because we're kind of learning and we wanna go with the simple stuff. So we're gonna add a new one. All we're doing here is giving a machine name or kind of name to get back to your list. It would, this would show up in the list of views. And here we're creating a page because we need a page for users to get to our three blog entries that we created. The page itself will get a page title. It, um, since it's not really content, it comes with a path, so there's another URL aliases for just the list. Um, and we'll go with all the defaults that are here on the option, except we're gonna add a menu link so that people can get to the list of blogs. And this is the label we'll call it, what would it be called, our blog, save and exit. And your view at this point is done, and it's since we 
chose a menu link, it's going to actually show up in the menu link, and now we have our content back. So that's, that's the very simple flow of adding views. You can see here there's a problem. It's still kind of like our river of content that was on our homepage. It's showing about us. It's showing a homepage. It would show any type of content you've added, but we don't want it to. So we're going to use a shortcut to get to back to our view. We could go back under structure at the top, but if you hover over your view as the right site administrator who has access to views, there's a little quick shortcut in the gear icon in the top right of the view to edit the view right there in line. Again, it's inline editing to keep it simple and get you working quick. There's a filter that we can add to that. And since we know it's the type of kind of filter, we're going to filter out all these options you get with views and just use type. So I know content type is what I want to filter out. And I only show, want to show this list of content on my site of a certain content type. And now I'm going to check off article, which is that content type, which is our blog in our case. Views is kind of a working state. So all of this is sort of in memory and stored temporarily until you hit save. So you get kind of a staging work area while you're working with views. And that's all there is to getting a list of content on your site filtered out by a specific kind of content. In our case, three blog entries and a list of blogs with a menu link. And it's not too much to setting up views. So you can imagine as you add more content to your site, maybe you had an event content, content type or some other, you know, something special and unique to your site. Just pair it with adding a page display of a view, filter it out by that content type, go with the defaults. And that's all there is to getting that list of content on your site. And it comes with a lot of bonus features like paging, and you could set up different layouts for it. It could be in a grid layout, it could be in a block layout. Um, so there's we don't have time to cover all that, but it's not too much to setting up views itself. Next up, let's look back at our anonymous view. It looks the same, except now we've got the home page. It's our home page. We've got the about us page. It's the, the client's about us page. And we've got this our blog link with three blog entries and three actual blog post details. We can get around to it. So it's not too. You know, in about less than 30 minutes, we've got a, a, a huge list of, let's say, uh, press releases were our blogs, if we used it that way, about us page and home page. That's, that's not a whole lot to get a, a website standing up in front of folks th that are anonymous in my book. It doesn't look that great, but we're going to try to change that pretty quickly. You could go with this out of the box. We're going to add an another contrib module here um, so that people can get in touch with us. It's a contact us form in our case. This is a module that a lot of people use to gather data or gather questions from your anonymous users or registered users in that case, and that's called Webform. Webform is a really powerful module for doing that. It makes it really easy to do it. And so we're setting that up in the same old formula where we go off to the modules page, get the latest recommended release, unzip it on our sites all modules folder, and install it. So it's, let's fast forward. Same formula, cl cleaning up some trash. Go to the modules page, enable view, um, excuse me, web form. We find it on our collapse down here, and we save. Since you've read the README, you now know what to do. Webform adds structure to your site. So Webform gives you a new content type. We used to have articles, we used to have pages, and now we have Webform when we go into content types as a content type itself. So that's a, that's a contrib module building upon core in its way. It says, I want to make Webform its own content type. So when we go into add content, now we can add a Webform. All content types with Drupal, again, come with a title and a body. So what we're going to do is fill out those things by default. Because we know we've got to give it a title, so when we see it in the content list of our site, we can edit it. We know how to call it. We don't have to give it a body, but we're going to do so in this case. And again, a menu link. So we're just going for efficiency. We're just trying to get a contact us form up. We're going with these defaults. We're going to put it in the main menu so everybody can get to it. And then next. We're going to um, actually configure web form and show you a little bit about what it does and how it gathers results from the in its uh, functionality. So web form gives you if you if you 
only added the content type and it wasn't web form, you'd only have view and edit, but web form builds upon that functionality by giving you these extra tabs. And now we're gonna add questions. We've read the readme and we know that questions are really called form components internally. Adding a field to web form is as simple as giving it a name, making it required, and giving it, um, mo just accept most of the defaults just to collect a name from your users on your form. So we're gonna do the same thing with email. Um, there's types of fields you can collect from um, your users in web form. They don't have to be text fields. Emails can actually be email fields and it'll do the validation for you. So you don't have to worry about someone putting in a non-email address in a text field for you. That's really handy and useful. And there's, there's, there's radio checkboxes and any kind of form element that you normally collect input is available in web form and then you can add your own, own as well if you wanna write code. So a text area is the final thing we're gonna grab from a, our users. We're gonna make them all mandatory fields for users to fill out and we're just kinda going through the workflow flow of web form. We've saved the components and what this has done is it's tacked on these three form components to our node which is the content type we added of web form. So if we go back and view the, um, we go to our homepage and view contact us. Since we gave it a menu link, we should see a web form. And here we do, we, do, we got a contact us form and inadvertently we also have a comments form at, at the bottom of our, con, our contact us form, which is weird. Um, but since the content type of web form as, as one of its settings has left commenting on, um, we're gonna edit that. So you can kind of cherry pick, you can set rules for your content types that say have con comments be enabled on or off by default, and then you can go into the content itself like a single instance of a web form, in our case, contact us page, and go in to edit it, which is what we just did. We've, we've gone in there and said, don't show comments on my comment form because it doesn't make sense. I guess it could make sense if you have that, if you, if, if you like living in the bazaar. So contact us, it looks good to the anonymous user, and we're gonna fill out some data just to show you how it looks. Oh, I think actually we're gonna restructure it. We didn't like where it showed up in the menu, so we're gonna drag and drop contact us. And so it's at the end of the list using structure, main menus, and reordering the menus. You could also do, do this by hand if you wanna do it numerically by setting the weight when you add um, the content. So contact us as the anonymous viewer, filling in some random fake data for nobody. I wanna show you how easy it is to collect data from your users and use that data back in the site maintenance account. So if we hop back, we've collected data, someone's filled out our form, we go back to our form, there's a results tab right here which is really useful in that it's gonna aggregate all of the data in some reporting options for you. So here's a list view of a single submission and I can view it. I can edit and delete it as well and see all the comments that, of the guy that just dropped by. Um, and then lastly, there's some really good secondary options with web form under results that allow us to do analysis on how each person filled out each component of our form. Um, if you had a bunch of components and you're doing polling data or something like that, you could review that there. You could also see it in a table format and you can also download it and ex export it as Excel and give it to your boss or whatever you need to do with your, that information. All right, we're trying to, I'm talking a lot so I'm gonna pause for a drink of water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the options in web form under, when you set up the web form, there was a sub tab there called email settings. Email settings are what to do when users um, fill out your form. You can have an auto respond right to them and you can, there's a text field for you to put in what you wanna say back to them. Um, you can have it notify you. There's a lot of options in there. So just when you, when you read the readme and when you poke around in there, in some of the options I skimmed by, look through that. It's under, I think it's under form settings or it's under email, excuse me. There's emails and form settings. The form settings will give you like thank you response messages and things like that. So you can, you can customize pretty much anything you want in web form. Um, here we go. We're gonna add 
our own content type. So far, we've been going with articles and blogs um, or blog posts and regular pages, and Webform gave us its own content type, but that doesn't stop you from making your own. And in our case, we're gonna try to get a little bit of multimedia on our site. We're gonna add a video content type. So let's say we have this one site, one specific function of showing some video because that's what our site's about. It's right here, setting up a content type is pretty much deciding what options you want to be available when a new user adds content. I say new users, that's really us in this case. We're the site maintenance account. But if should you give other authors a, a, a way to add content, these are all the defaults that they see. So think about it that way when you're setting up new content types. And, it, and new content types are just buckets, way to categorize your content. And you can extend it and do what you want. So say we're going to do a list of videos on our site. What we're doing here is we're setting up a content type called video, and we're just giving it some default options like can people comment on it? Is it published by default? Um, what, is it going to live in the main menu and by default? And of course, when they add that content, they can change any of that. But these are just kind of the rules to put in place as the content type, as a basic page, as an article, in our case, as a video. So we're giving it a name and a label, so when you go to add the content, you'll see these things next when we go to do it. It's a video, so we're probably going to be missing the actual video, which is what I'm going to show you next, but kind of merging that into what it looks like at this point to also add a content type. So now adding the content type, it now shows up when you go to add content on your site, and you can give it a title. We'll call it My Video. And we'll give that some text. I'm going to speed through this because we've seen it a couple times at this point. We're going to give this a menu link just so we can quickly get it up on our page and everybody can see our video. We'll call it My Video. We'll leave it right where it is as far as the parent menu. And we see it. OK, what's missing? Right. So adding a video requires going to Drupal.org and getting a recommended release for Drupal 7 is the media module. This, this is a really handy module for adding media to your site. It'll handle audio, it'll handle video, it'll, it'll actually handle files for you pretty well. It's got a lot to it. We're going to keep it really simple because we have one sole purpose for it, to show videos to our site. You could substitute audio in there for that. All we're doing here is going to the media um, contrib modules page. We've read through all of its documentation, which is actually pretty good on this site. And it says there's a known issue here, which is really just information. Um, audio and videos by default won't be shown unless we grab, grab this recommended module here called MediaFront. There's, there's 600 ways to do this, I think, in media. But this is what's recommended. And I found like this is the easiest. I got the other releases version, the one in yellow here, because it has more functionality. And you don't necessarily always have to go with a recommended release, the one that's in green. If you know what you're doing, you've read up, there's features, you might want to go with the other releases or even the dev version. But chances are you're better staying in the green. Um, for, for the media module, sorry if I keep, am I, I must be hitting that or something. Yeah. Am I cool? All right, sorry. Um, we're going to grab media front module and the media module itself. So we'll kind of speed through this because we've seen it several times. We're site builders now. This is all stuff we've done before. So the goal here is to get a field added to our content type of video. And we need media front and all these related modules to do so. And that's all we've done here. Now if we go back to structure and we go back to content types and <laughs> we, I'll, I'll just talk. And we go back to manage fields. We skipped this option um, before. Managing fields, these are the fields that come with the content type by default. We, we know everything's had a title. We've already talked about URL paths for that. And as a body, you can optionally take away body from your content type. But the best part about it is you can add fields to your content type. Add new field, and we're going to we need a field for people to upload video. So in our case, this is going to be a, f a file field. So there's all kinds of types of fields you can add to your content type. You could add images or list or references to other content um, or just plain text. In our case, a video file is a file. 
So we're going to call it that. And this is when you go to add content, you're actually going to see this field now. Widgets are over here on the third, fourth column. Widgets are ways to interact with that field. In the media module, built upon this functionality by giving us something called the media file selector. It's a really useful module. So when we go to add the field and the video itself, we'll have some really cool interface to do so. Or pretty cool, I should say. <laughs> All right, so. I'm just going through the secondary steps. There's a little bit more to, to set up of this. You might want to watch this back in your playback, but we're actually setting up media front module, so we have a way to display this while we're at it. It's really just two options. Tell this field type of the video file to be a media front um, enabled field, and then in here, these are regular settings for the file field type to say, allow people to upload MP. MPEG-4s, MP4 in our case. So most of it is, is stuff we need to come back and review, but we're going to go with the defaults and only do what we have to to get a video playing on our site. So media module is very powerful. We're skimming the, the um, options and going with the defaults. Now we've got our field. And if we go back to our content itself, we should be able to edit that field. And at this point, we can upload the video file itself. So this is the, what adding a field to your content, content type does. It, it gives you more stuff to fill out when you add the content. And, and on the flip side of that, you get to figure out how you're going to show that to the audience. This is the, the cool interface for picking the media. If it was a file, you could actually just do the regular upload. But Media Module let, allows you to upload, pull things from the web, and you can also use a library of things local on your site. We're going to go with the easier one, which is just to upload. But preparing for the future, we can add videos from the web or from other parts of our site. I'm, I'm picking a random video I found um, on archive.org of 1950s party eti etiquette for women named Cindy. It's called Cindy Goes to a Party. This is our sample video. What, <laughs> what it does at this point is just shows you, media module just shows you an icon of it. And if you save the node, it, it brings you back to the view display of your node. And the problem here is that since it's a file and the field type of file, it only lists the file, which isn't that helpful unless you want a site that does that just to put files out there for the public to download. So there's one extra step here. Using the media front module, we are, we've read the readme of media front, and we know to, actually, I forgot in my demo to enable the open standards player, which is the video player media front uses. So that's under modules, we've enabled that, and we know to go to the structure and set up media front, and that's what I'm doing here. I'm going to media front presets, and we're adding a preset. I know this is really fast because we're running out of time. It's basically, here's what your preset will look like. This is what your player will look like. You have options for configuring media front players for all, so you could have, you could have a, a black player or a white player or different skins and themes for your HTML5 ready player here, that's a requirement to get now get that field that we've added to our video content type a way to present the data. So when, every time we present the video, now if we go to manage display of our content type, which is the output. So you put fields into your content type and you give them something, a way to, to show them going out to the world. By default, it was just showing the generic file. We're going to change that, and since we've already done the work in setting up media front and media front players, it's an option in the, f the display formatter, which is the kind of the outgoing presentation for the world. And by picking that, it'll bring up the players that we set up. So here, we've only got one. It's the black skin, um, that, the default one that comes with media front. So it's pretty easy to, to do that. A lot of steps involved, but go back if you want to watch this video and just play it a little slower, and you'll, you'll get a follow along, hopefully. So the last part of this, there you go. If you go back to the view, you should have a video. And now we can watch Cindy goes to a party from the 1950s. We're not going to do that part. Um, I think there's also a link to that, yeah. So we're 1130. I've gone over by six minutes. I can. Um, 
take up your time or you, you can go if you're ready to go. The next part I'm going to do is, is blaze th you through adding a thumb nail to um, Cindy goes to a party so that when you come to the node page there'll be an image there a kind of poster frame you've heard it referred to maybe as a poster frame so that looks good before you users hit play and then lastly I'm gonna install a base theme if, if you're in Thomas's session he, he was highly suggesting uh, sub themes I'm gonna install a base theme called adaptive theme which is HTML5 theme that's responsive tablet ready f uh, mobile ready and then, and then a sub-theme of that called Sky Theme, and Sky Theme has a plethora of options for you to go home and tweak. So if you're trying to build a site in one hour, you want to maybe use these themes as a starting place because when you see the settings of this, you can change everything from fonts to colors to add your own logos. And I really don't think I can talk, as, um, talk us through all that without, I don't think we have time for that, so I'm gonna just gonna play, play through what that looks like. I'll kind of narrate as best I can. I'm adding a, for media front, you have to do a thumbnail, which is an additional field. Go through the defaults, set up a media front setting of image type, assign it a, a style in, up front, give it a PNG, JPEG, or GIF. At this point, you're, you have a new field added to your content type. We're gonna change it to hidden, so when it's displayed, the, the world doesn't see it, but media front is smart enough to know when we upload, which I'm doing here, a JPEG of the poster frame, it's going to link those two things together and now that JPEG is there before you start the actual playback, which is pretty, pretty helpful. So at this point, we're going to go get adaptive theme. I'm going to go really quick. Adaptive theme is a good base theme. It's HTML5 friendly, it's responsive, and sky theme is a pretty good um, starter uh, sub theme with a lot of theme settings and options installing them. We did every, all the installs under Sites All Themes instead of Sites All Modules. Um, that you, you know that by looking at the README. We're enabling the base theme of Adaptive Theme Core and the Sky Theme. We've done all this under Appearance in our Site Maintenance account. And if we go and refresh our content, it's kind of vanilla by default, which is the options that come with um, Sky Theme. And there's a blocks page. You, you kind of have to reassign content. I don't have time to talk about this because we're running out of time. But blocks are bits and pieces around your content and reassigning them to places within your themes or regions. All we're doing here is we're taking the main menu, which when I enabled the Sky Theme, there it is, it's being responsive. Can you tell? People do that all the time to say, hey, is this responsive? Just drag it around and, and find out. Look at all these options you get with Sky Theme. If you wanted to build a client site in one hour, and you, and, and you wanted to theme it for them while you're there or let them do it, these are all the options you can do to um, change the look and feel of sky settings, and there's a ton. Rounded corners, fonts, layouts, breadcrumbs, search results, everything you see listed here, all configurable. And then you can cherry pick different colors for different parts of your site, and it's not too bad to theme. If, you, if, you, if this isn't good enough for you, you either go look at other themes on Drupal.org or you, you know, talk to someone that does theming or come to more sessions. You come to Shardug at the first Wednesday of every month and you ask these questions and we'll hook you up. <laughs> so that's it. This is what it looks like when you're done. It's purple. <laughs> I didn't have time to make it really shiny bells and whistles, but this is all the content you've added and, and just installing a theme and tweaking it out to use sky theme and change the colors a little bit. And I think my mouth is dry, so I'm done. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business changing applications from small office phone systems to mission critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country 
whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisks. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk-based systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox-based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an assumption, I think. When you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, 
It's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CogStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack.